Welcome to the Veterinary Project Podcast, episode 049. Welcome to the show created by vets featuring absolutely no pets. This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, hosted by Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Our resident veterinarians have swapped out their stethoscopes in favor of microphones to bring you the Veterinary Project Podcast, a show focused on real conversations aimed to connect this amazing profession full of remarkable people. Through the sharing of collective stories and wisdom and connecting over the many unique challenges we face, we invite you to join our community of veterinary professionals leading intentional lives. And now, here are the hosts of the Veterinary Project Podcast, Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Welcome back to the Veterinary Project Podcast podcast. You have your two hosts, Dr. Michael Bug, Dr. Jonathan Light. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Jonathan. Another early morning recording. So I was, I was wondering what kind of intro we were going to get. Well, you got to change it up a little bit. I put some different cadences in there. I'm not sure if it worked or not. We might have lost half our guests or half our listeners already. How are you doing today? Fantastic. Yeah, it's uh, well, we're recording this Friday morning. Another beautiful day. Um, we just sort of discovered, and I don't know how, I've lived in Saskatoon over 10 years. They have all these little mini water parks for kids, like all over the city, and they have one single water slide in them. You know, and it's, it's a decent size water slide, pretty fun. And we took Riley, and she just loves it. I, we were going to hotels, and it's like, these are like 15 bucks. You get to drop in for like two hours. There's a you pool. Have to pay for your spray parks in Saskatoon? Well, no, this isn't a spray park. Oh. The spray parks are free. You can just go play in the spray parks. These are like mini like water parks, like a full-on pool with a full-on water slide. Very cool. Yeah. Get on Saskatoon. I've not heard of these before. So that's what we're doing at six o'clock. Uh, right as soon as she gets out of daycare, it'll still be like plus 30. So that's that's us. That's you in a nutshell. Well, I wish we could say the same on our end. We've got a big day today here. We uh, are just finishing with our couple of last inspections. We passed our regulatory board inspection yesterday, which allows us to open. And then the big city inspection is this morning. Dun, dun, dun. So, you know, we're cutting a little quiet, a little, little tight. So we got a lot of work yeah. to do this weekend, but uh, Bridgeland Vet Clinic should be opening up for business on Monday morning, which is okay. really exciting. Yeah. So for the listeners, we're recording this one July 30th, Friday. Jonathan's Vet Clinic opens Monday, August 2nd. So three three days from now? That's correct. And there's not even any uh, sweat in the armpits yet. You're not even sweating. Looks cool as a cucumber. There's no point in that. If you've done your due diligence, etc., uh, it's out of our hands now. This is definitely in the contractor's hands this morning. If they've done their job, then knock on wood, all our codes should be passed. We've definitely had to make some last minute 48 hour changes uh, unfortunately due to some, some issues on the landlord works done, but we're getting through it. And, uh, yeah, our team, man, it's, it's so fun. Uh, so our, our team and, and bringing everybody together, they've worked in different areas. The majority of our team knew each other, but to watch even in the first week of our team coming together, as we've now had to set up templates, our workflow, what it's going to look like for who does what it's a beautiful orchestra that you're trying to put together and I think this week, the biggest thing for me is to been trying to step back, lead, delegate, and then help where needed, but let them do what they do. It has been, I, I've been so happy with the group this week. It's yeah. I awesome. saw a few of your Instagram posts and it's really special when you have the right people with, you know, skills that are above your own and you just get out of their way and let them do their thing. It's exactly what this was supposed to be about. Yeah. But enough about that. Uh, Let's get into it. This is a follow-up to our last Mike and Johnny episode. What are we talking about today? What are we going to get into for our listeners? Why does this matter? Okay, well, today we're going to talk about passive income uh, slash passive wealth generation. So building off our previous conversation around the cash flow quadrant, this would be the, the B quadrant and more specifically the I quadrant. Right. That's so this, this is generating income or wealth passively, which uh, for, as a refresher means not outlaying a bunch of your time. Yeah. Right. So how do we make money without exchanging time? 
And this one's a personal one to us, isn't it? We've been going through this. This is something that connected us right from day one. And I think it's, it's fair to say, Mike, that we get a number of reach outs for individuals in the vet space that are looking to do exactly this. They may be tired of the manual labor. Actually, we just talked with someone, one of our mutual friends this week about that. They're tired of the mutual labor. They might have injuries on the large animal side. That's now going to prevent them from doing as many preg checks, et cetera, as they want to. Or they've reached a point where maybe they have less debt and they want to use their money differently. Is that, do, you, do you agree with that statement? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's just, it's, it is what it is. Time is a limited resource, right? There's only 24 hours in the day. This isn't shocking news to anyone. Yeah. And when you get into the, the thick of things as a veterinarian, and I'm, I'm just making up some numbers here, but let's say you make 100 grand a year and you're a typical veterinarian that's supposed to be full-time, which is supposed to be 40 hours a week, but we all know what that turns into, right? And it's like, if you want to double your income, if you want to go from 100 grand to 200 grand, you just physically can't work double that amount of time. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just not possible. I haven't talked to a single veterinarian in the last forever, where when you ask them, how are they doing? The first thing out of their mouth isn't, I'm so busy, I'm swamped, I don't have any time, right? So if you don't have more time, you've got to start looking at options that don't require more time. That's right. right? That's, that's where it kind of went for me. And I'm totally flipping the, the script on our notes. So we discussed the philosophy of this prior to the start of this recording this morning, and there's some different versions of what you should do. And therefore, we are not financial experts. I'll put that out there. This is based on the two of ours experience. And in such, there's a couple of different really large philosophies out there. One of those philosophies, the first is um, been very, very popular. And that's from a gentleman named Dave Ramsey. And he has great education out there. But his philosophy would say that you should not be investing until you have paid off all of your debt, including mortgage debt. So some of the discussion that we're having today, Mike and I don't abide by that philosophy. It doesn't make it right or wrong, but we know that we wouldn't be in our place in our financial life if we had taken that philosophy. That would have said, if we have student debt, of which I had a little bit of, if I had a mortgage, which I took on for the first time in 2009, I wouldn't have been able to start. I still wouldn't be starting to invest because I have debt on that personal side. That being said, we know a lot of veterinarians are coming out of school with more and more debt. We know that a lot of veterinarians are coming out and are feeling that that time crunch is completely there at any stage of their careers. So we take the opposite philosophy. Tell us a little bit about what that opposite philosophy is, Mike. Yeah. And again, this is personal. This is just me. I like to, I mean, I disagree with that. I'm more about playing offense. How I look at tackling that is I would be more inclined to build an asset in my life. So whether this is, and we'll get into this stock portfolio or real estate for me, it was real estate that spits out cash that then pays your debt. That's how I would look at it. So rather than me working, taking my money and paying my debt, I would work, take my money, buy or build an asset, then have that asset pay off my debt. So you're still paying off your debt. You're just doing it in a different way. And then once that debt is paid off and it disappears, you still have the asset. And now instead of using all that money that it spits out to pay off debt, use it to do whatever you want. Invest more, go on a holiday, buy something, you know? Excellent. So, That's my little spin on that philosophy. So you're using the money that you create from your job, from other avenues of using your time for money and then paying off that existing debt, whether it's student debt, mortgage debt, personal debt, et cetera, but then going towards investments, which then grow over time. Yeah. For someone just coming out of school, and we talked about this, Mike, this can be really daunting. You and me, even we've had many, many conversations about the investing world. What do we do? We've gone to all the conferences. We both had investments that have fallen south with individuals that we wish we wouldn't have got into business before previous. It's really daunting. So what do we do if we're young in our career or even mid span in our career and go, darn it, I got to get going here. Yeah. 
I think, you know, one of the, the most tangible pieces of advice would be to break it down because it's overwhelming when you look at the, the big picture. Like, let's say you have 200,000 in, in debt and you're looking at that. And it's like, how am I going to pay that off? And it's like, well, you're going to pay it off one dollar at a time that's how you're not going to pay it off two hundred thousand at a time you know it's the classic how do you eat an elephant it's one at a time so i would start by tackling you know using my system of using your money to buy an asset to pay debt break it into smaller chunks so it's like okay well how can i earn my first one hundred dollars a month passively right and then then build from there so Oh, this is great. And look at that. He feeds into the next portion of the conversation like nothing. So you mentioned that he wants to build that first asset passively. This is a big piece. And this is thrown around quite a bit in terms of what is passive income? What does passive wealth or passive income look like? And again, we're not financial experts. This is our experience versus what we've done in our own worlds. So passive income from your perspective, Mike, what does that look like? Well, ideally, the gold standard is it takes no time. Now, r- realistically, that probably doesn't exist. Yeah. So let's just call it low amount of time. And uh, using uh, the apartment building that I've mentioned on this podcast that we're working on right now, the first portion of that is not passive, right? It was a major renovation project, very active, that's still ongoing Hopefully by the end of July here, as we get into August, for me, it will flip where it will become passive yeah. because the renovations will be done. I'll have property managers in place. And at that point in time, that apartment building should take me about one hour per month, right? Wow. And then we'll throw on a little bit extra. So say 12 hours a year and then throw on another eight hours because at some point in the year, something is going to come up that's going to require a, you know a little a little chunk of my time one or two hours to deal with so maybe maybe it's 20 hours or so over the span of a year so for me i'll consider that passive that's not no time but it's very little time excellent and in doing that your upfront costs your upfront time or return on time is made up for then in the later months, years, et cetera, while that asset is still owned by you. Yeah, that's how I look at it is big output of effort to get the asset running, then it shifts into passive. And what you said there is really important. It's a mindset shift, kind of away from only return on investment, which everyone wants to think about, right? Like, are you generating 6%, 8%, 10, 12, over to return on time, right? So then you start thinking, okay, well, what is my time worth? And so if you're a veterinarian, how I would look at this is, you know, using that whatever 100,000 a year example, working 40 to 60 hours a week, figure out what is one hour of your time worth, right? That's your return on time. Then when you're looking at these investments, so using that apartment, I get to take the, the money and the wealth it generates. I only have to divide it by 20 hours on a year. My return on time is going to be very high. Definitely. Right. So you start doing get into that kind of detail or do you, you know what you're getting into just based on the time that you've now done this with? Yeah. I, I know, like I just sort of do the napkin math on it where, you know, is is it, if something is going to lock me down for 40 hours a week, it better pay tremendously. Right. Cause it's just too much time outlay. And as we've already talked about, you only have so much time. You know, once you've spent it, it's gone. So true. I was just doing some napkin math. And if you do napkin math and you are able to passively, which is a large amount, passively build to making $100 a day, that comes out to just under a million a year. It's a big deal. Yeah. And just like you said, taking that 200 grand, debt that you may have and breaking it down into dollar by dollar, it makes a difference. So let's talk about some of those modes of passive income. And I'm using passive income somewhat in a, in quotation marks. Yeah. But let's walk through a number of these different options that veterinarians, vet technologists, people within our industry can do. 
Let's yeah. talk about them. Let's talk about their differences and how they can work towards building your passive wealth. Why this right. is so excellent. So what's number one on the list? Yeah. Okay, I got five of them for you. They're not ranked in order of like one is the best and five is the worst. They're just whatever. Uh, number one's the easiest for everyone to get into. You've definitely heard of it. It's just the stock market, right? You've, you've probably heard it referred to as mutual funds, which are just a collection of stocks. You can do individual stocks. Very easy to transact, right? You open a brokerage account, you put your money in, you buy the stock. This is the most passive right? You have, it, you're buying a, a mini piece of a company. And an example I wanted to share just because it's a lot of people uh, use the product would be Starbucks, right? And I'm not pro Starbucks. I don't own it. That's my, my disclosure on here. I'm just using it as an example, but Starbucks pays a dividend. So they pay 45 cents a share and their dividend actually comes out here at the end of August. What does that mean? So that means that Starbucks, this big company, worldwide company makes this profit and then they share that profit with their shareholders in the form of a dividend. And so they will pay you your sort of percentage of the profit. So for Starbucks, that looks like 45 cents a share and that gets paid out quarterly. So at the end of August, if you own hundred shares of Starbucks, you'll see $45 American hitting your bank account. And so using what we talked about earlier, I like to think about this as systems to eliminate debt or to eliminate expenses. Mm -hmm. So if you're a Starbucks coffee drinker and you own a hundred shares of Starbucks, when August comes around and you get your $45, you get to buy $45 worth of coffee sort of for free, right? That expense is taken care of by your system, which is owning shares. So that's how I would start to encourage people to get started and thinking about things like eliminate your coffee expense by owning shares in the company you, of the coffee you want to drink. And now it's taken care of forever, forever, right? So that's number one, stocks um, that pay dividend. Excellent. And going into the semantics of stocks even right now, there's fractional, fractional ownership that's just come into play, which is really cool. I'm getting buzzed off the, the robo app that I use that you can now buy fractional stocks of big item stocks such as Amazon, which goes for right now around 2,600 and some a share. That's a lot of money for just one share. Now you can buy portions of that share towards companies just as Mike explained there that you might want to reduce your expenses with. Great, great example, Mike. What's number two? Uh, number two is a REIT. So a REIT is a real estate investment trust. Um, so what this is, is this is slightly different than owning real estate on your own. When you own a REIT, you're buying into a basket of real estate and, and you can get really specific. It can be a REIT that owns industrial properties or apartment buildings. It can be in a certain geography. It can be all across Canada, the world, whatever you want. Um, so when you're buying a REIT, just the same as buying a stock, you now own a certain number of units in that real estate, and then they will pay you a distribution mm -hmm. because you own that, right? So very similar to the stock example, instead of it being surround or focused on a company, it's focused on real estate. And where does somebody find these REITs to invest in? Okay, good question. To keep it really simple, there will be public and private REITs. Public REITs are just like stocks. They trade on the stock market. You can buy and sell them daily. It shows you their distributions. Private ones, you would have to go through uh, what's called an exempt market dealer, right? So you'd have to find one in your local area, develop a relationship. They may have some parameters around uh, whether you're accredited or not. Like you may need to be a high net worth individual for those private REITs. Yeah. Uh, but the public ones, you do not, right? There's REITs on the stock market you can go and buy in a second and, and now you're an owner. Fantastic. Let's move it forward to number three. Okay, number three is sticking with real estate. Uh, but instead of it being a REIT, it's just you yourself owning real estate. Um, full disclosure, obviously, I'm super biased there that this has been my number one mode of passive income and wealth building. Um, so yeah, it's it's exactly as it sounds. You You own real estate. That's like that apartment building I keep updating everyone on. That would be the classic example. I would like to point out 
real estate, um, depending how you do it, may not be passive, right? It often gets glorified as this amazing passive investment. If you're managing it, it is not passive, right? There will be an active effort, but you can make it passive. And it's not just income. I, I kind of classify it almost more as passive wealth building yep. because that mortgage pay down is such a key to your success. That's correct. So people, I think, throw this, uh, this just naive vision to what it looks like when you own real estate. Uh, oh yeah, you must be loaded. You just bought this building. So you must just have cash coming out to nowhere. And in the two buildings that Candace and I have owned over the years, that is definitely not the case. On a month by month basis, what is the target dollars that we're trying to earn net by unit? What does that look like? Oh, that's a tough question. The big um, question. Yeah, it's going to vary for, for everyone and it'll vary where you're placing your buildings. Totally. I would just say as a starting point, it, it needs to be positive. And I'm this sort of huge. Saying, this is huge. I know I'm saying that laughing, but a lot of people brush over that and they don't run their numbers and then they own a piece of real estate that is actually taking money out of their pocket. Now, granted, they're paying their mortgage down. So yes, overall, they're positive, but you can't put yourself in a situation where the money's flowing backwards and you have to feed it every month. So right. honestly, for the point of this podcast, I would say cash flow positive, which just means more than enough money comes in to cover your expenses. Um, and then going back to what you, what you said about, you know, people think it's just this uh, like super passive investment. I would use an analogy maybe of, of a vet clinic. So no one would buy a vet clinic that does not have a clinic manager or an office manager or any sort of management at all and think I can just buy it and never show up and the place will just run and spit out all this income and everything will be great. Yet somehow people do that in real estate. They think I just buy this house and it just somehow manages itself and fixes itself and everything's great. And it's like, well, no, you have to have the system. So it's no different than trying to run a vet clinic. It can be passive if you have the system in place. That's great. So as an example for that, Mike, I think it's really good that you mentioned that. I think Candace and I, bought, I don't think we bought our first real estate property in 2011 and it was a threeplex and we had no idea what we're doing. I'm so thankful that we did that though. It had changed our life. We took a risk, but in creating the system over the next 10 years, up until we've just sold our last property here in the last October, that system allowed us to then build wealth over time in order to us to make the next step. And that system, we went to conferences, we looked online, we lost money. But that, that journey to learn the system was worthwhile and therefore allowed us to be positive and therefore eventually be able to sell yeah. the properties out of it. And it takes time. I have multiple people that have reached out and said, how do you do that, Jonathan? Get started. Yeah. 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 And this is where, like, this is the splitting hairs on passive income. So yeah. if you remember the cash flow quadrant, what Jonathan just described, that was more of a B quadrant situation where he built the systems right? And then it, then it becomes an I quadrant. And again, it doesn't matter. You can play in both. That's fine. Yep. Uh, but that's the process that you have to go through. Yep. And mine was different than your process because I was managing those units all myself. I didn't have a financial setup where I could have a management company and still be cash flow positive. That's how tight my numbers were in Calgary. That's all right. That's what I signed up for. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. Different setup. Excellent. All right. Let's go to number four. Okay, number four may not be that well known. Uh, this is private lending and even private mortgages. So the, on the private lending piece is, is as simple as, you know, you can lend your funds to someone for a percent return. Now, full disclosure, you really need to vet that, that interaction, that relationship of who you're lending money to. Um, private mortgages, not a lot of people know that you can actually have someone hold the mortgage on your place. So using a Canadian example, most people think you have to go to one of the big banks, get your mortgage, buy your house. But actually I could go to Jonathan and I could be like, Hey, I'm buying this house. It's 300,000. I need a mortgage of 250,000. 
and, and we agree to all the terms and Jonathan can be like, yeah, that sounds great. Give, give the 250,000 to me to buy the house. And he gets registered on title of that property as the mortgage holder. And I pay Jonathan. So Jonathan becomes the bank, right? And Why this- would somebody do that, Mike? Why? Yeah. Again, and we're going to use Canadian examples on this and, and, uh, Full you disclosure, can, this is experience only. Yeah. And you can do this in the States. I'm like, I yep. know you can. Lots. I have friends that yep. do this. So it applies across the border. Yeah. Why would you do that? Why would you like, why would someone want to start building their wealth via private mortgages? So the reason you would do that is when we talk about the degrees of being passive, this is very, very passive, right? Once you sign those papers, it's done. It's, it's just like the bank, Right. The bank doesn't have to do anything every single month when you pay your mortgage payment, right? And sure, you're paying off your equity, but you're also paying them a, a chunk of interest, right? So it's, it's very hands-off. Um, it's easy once it's set up. And then from a security standpoint, you're registered against that asset. So if in, in our example of you putting a mortgage on my property, if I stopped paying you, you have that asset as security, so you can go and take that house back, recover your $250,000. So when it's done properly, it's very secure. And is that interest that you earn for that investment lower the same or higher usually than going to a normal bank lender? So in, in the private world, it will typically be higher than, than what a bank will offer. Um, and it really varies on the term. Like, is it a short-term loan? Is it a long-term mortgage? What what is like the loan to value on it. So there's a, there's a ton of like negotiating room in there, but it can be very powerful. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. And sorry, one last thing I, I won't go long in this. You can also use registered funds, which most people do not know. So up in Canada, that's your TFSA, that's your RRSPs. You can use those funds to hold mortgages on Canadian real estate. And I know that also applies in the States. I don't know what all their accounts are called, but a similar thing can be done. Interesting. And that's a whole different discussion. Number five, the last one that we're going to talk about today. What is that? Uh, private businesses. So, you know, that's just simply investing in a, in a private business. We open number one with investing in the stock. That's just a public business. So very similar to investing in stocks, except it's not on a stock exchange, yeah. you know, so the classic example would be someone that's starting up. Um, I mean, we could even use a vet clinic example. Yep. If someone wanted to start up a vet clinic, but they didn't have the funds to do so, maybe they partner with someone that does have the funds. That person invests their money. They work out an arrangement. It's probably a percent ownership in the vet clinic. Um, so for the person that's investing the funds, that's a passive investment in a business. Um, very powerful you know, the, the, the home run examples are like the people that got in early with Facebook and Uber. That's how all these companies start is they start private before they go public. Excellent. And how does the average individual that's trying to build their wealth, how do they go about doing that? That's a good question. This one is all about connections, right? This is where what I did so wrong in vet school, and if I had to do it over again, I would have known everyone in that vet school way better. And like, not from a selfish place, like I like meeting people, but it's like, you have no clue where that's going to go. Like maybe that classmate of yours is going to go start some cool radiology app or who knows, like I'm just making stuff up here. But this is really comes down to who you know, and kind of being along when you hear that idea these can be risky because I mean, percentage wise, percentage of businesses that fail is high. Um, but, you know, at the, the, the sort of right place, right time, right idea, th- there can be a lot of opportunity there. And the private equity fund guys that do this, I don't know the exact numbers, but that's what they do. They invest in multiple, multiple businesses, understanding that, that the majority of them are going to fail. But yeah. if they hit one home run, it makes up for all the rest. Yeah. And, and even just to throw a different spin on this, because it doesn't have to be home run hitting, there can be well-established private businesses that are just looking to grow. And during their growth process, they may do like a private placement or bring on investors because they need that capital to keep growing. So those can be way lower risk 
because they're so well established. They just need a cash injection and they don't want to go through the whole process of listing on the stock exchange. No, that's great. Yeah. Well, Mike, I really hope that this was informative and uh, I help to those that are out there, whether you're just coming out of school, you're starting early in your career, or you're a little bit further along the way and looking for a different way to uh, accumulate wealth, pay off debt, and take your investing career to the next level. This is really important. I think this is part of the total package of being a professional. I think we have a lot of options in our world that exist outside of just making money for your time. We hope that this is beneficial. Any words in parting, Mike? This one's a big one for you. You spent a lot of time in this arena. Yeah, this is one of the areas I'm easily the most passionate about. Um, just because I see it happening so much in the veterinary space. And it's, it's like, you know, veterinarians are amazing at what they do. They're amazing. It's just simply there's only so much time. And, you know, using that analogy, like if that's the, the hammer in your toolbox and you're very good with it, definitely go use it. But you need to you have, develop other tools, right, so that you can make money while you're without having to go back and put in that the, the 70 or the 80 hours because it just burns people out. Like we don't need any more evidence than we have already to see. You know, if we keep doing what we're doing, it's not working, right? But you're tremendous veterinarians. Let's just take some financial pressure off you on the back end with a few other tools, maybe allow you to have a little more breathing room where you can spend some time at home, recover, still yep. come to the vet clinic and do what you love, but actually be recharged and ready for it. So that's why I get so fired up about it as I want those other systems in place to allow that. And I think that is part of the key industry-wide, making this industry just more amazing for the people in it, for the pets in it, for the clients, for everyone. Excellent. For anybody out there that wants to know more, has questions, et cetera, ping Mike on social media, send him an email. I know for a fact he's wanting to talk to you. <laughs> I'll talk your ear off probably, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, it's Friday. We've got a lot to do. Okay. Mike, hope you have a fantastic day for our listeners going into the weekend. Absolutely. And for our listeners, by the time this episode comes out on Wednesday, Jonathan's uh, Bridgeland Veterinary Clinic will be open. It'll be day three of operations. Yep. Uh, so send them a congrats message or you know, like them on Facebook or Instagram or whatever they're doing. So congrats, buddy. I know, I know this has been a big uh, dream of yours. You've been yep. putting a lot of work in. So appreciate it, buddy. Yeah, yeah. We're excited for day one. Anybody that wants to come check us out. We're on Instagram at Bridgeland Vet Clinic. Uh, we're going to do a lot of fun social on that. And um, there's some fun people out there with a lot of dogs and cats that want them posted on social. That's for sure. <laughs> All right. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Veterinary Project Podcast. As a recap, on behalf of our hosts, the Veterinary Project Podcast will be releasing new episodes weekly. So be sure to tune in as we bring you more conversations aimed at helping you enjoy a life well lived. If you enjoyed what you heard on the show and you want to stay in the know, please like, love, and or subscribe to the podcast on the listening platform of your choosing, as we're available on all the usual suspects. If you know of others that may benefit from these conversations, we'd love it if you please share the show with them, as this will help us grow our community to reach more and more veterinary professionals. Speaking of which, if you are a veterinary professional and would like to get connected with more like-minded individuals who are joining us on this journey, please send an email to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com, and we'll invite you to be a part of our private Facebook group general feedback, requests for information, or perhaps requests to be a guest on the show can also be sent to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com. Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light, thank you for listening to the show, and we'll catch you again next week for another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. Bye for now. Bye for now.